Good morning, church. We're so glad you're here. Come on, why don't you stand to your feet across the room? And come on, put your hands together just like this. Man, we've come to give Jesus praise, to exalt the name of Jesus today. So I invite you, one church, one body, one mind. Let's put our hands together, lift our voices. Let's worship Jesus today. Come on, let's do it. Hey. He shames every idol. He reigns without right.
we love you, King Jesus. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy that's chasing after us. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, Till I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Everybody, come on, let's live it up this morning. And all my life you have been faithful. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made.
across the room today, would you do this? Would, would you join me? Would you lift your hands to heaven for a few moments? And there's a, there's a lyric that we just got done singing. It's, with my life laid down, I surrender now, Lord. I give you everything. And this posture of, this posture of surrender, sitting, literally standing here with our hands wide open to heaven, that is, that is telling the Lord with our physical posture, God, Lord, I surrender everything, God. I lay it at your feet. Jesus told us, he encouraged us, cast your cares upon me. So if you're here in the room, whatever care, whatever worry, whatever, whatever anxiety you have, man, just cast it all, whatever need, cast it all at the feet of Jesus today. And take his yoke upon you. His yoke is easy. His burden is light today. And his presence is here in the room, God. And we welcome you, Lord Jesus. Lord, see our hearts, God, humbled before you, God. Humble before you, Lord, in your presence, Lord Jesus. And God, Lord, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come fill us, oh God. Fill us anew, Lord Jesus, with a new grace, God, new strength, God, new mercies for this morning, Lord Jesus. See your sons and your daughters, God, as we stand with our hands lifted to heaven, abandoned before you. And we say, God, we surrender everything, God. We lay it at your feet this morning, King Jesus. We pray all these things in the powerful and mighty and capable hands of Jesus, our Savior. And everyone said, amen. One more time. Come on, church. Do you love the Lord today? Come on. He is good. His love endures forever. Woo. Man, my name is John. It is my honor and privilege to serve you guys here as the Northwest worship pastor here at Traders Point, and I want to welcome you, whether you're here in the room or you're joining us online, welcome to today's service. And if you're visiting us for the first time or checking us out for the first time, we want to extend a special welcome to you, church. Can we welcome all those checking us out for the first time in the room, online? We're so glad you're here. Welcome to church. And if you've been here for a little while, you said, man, John, how do I make this big church feel small? How do I get community? How do I meet people um, and, and walk in, in, in the purpose and the call and I believe God's given me? Next week, I would ask one thing. Next week, after our second service at 1030, I want you to head upstairs um, and check out a place called First Step. You can actually go to this link, tpcc.org slash first step. Register right there. You're gonna, all you're gonna do is you're gonna meet some of our pastors and staff here at the Northwest Campus. And we're gonna just walk you through, hey, what does the first steps look like for you to get involved and be a part of what God's doing here at Traders Point? I'm telling you, he's doing something miraculous. He's doing something incredible in the, in the city of Indianapolis. I mean, we have such an incredible opportunity to be a partner with him and be part of what God's doing. Amen, church? All right, well, hey, man, we're gonna, we're gonna kick off. We're gonna actually bring this message series, Adventures in Dating and Marriage, to a close this week with our lead pastor, Aaron Brockett. Before we do that, though, can you turn around, say hey to someone you haven't seen yet, man, wish them a good morning, and then you can take your seats, and then, church, can you help me welcome our lead pastor, Aaron Brockett, up to the stage. welcome you back this Thursday night, February 22nd, for our worship night. Uh, all campuses under one roof right here in Northwest is going to be great. So I just want to invite you to come uh, from uh, those of you that maybe call another campus home, maybe those of you that are watching online, uh, make it a priority to be here Thursday night. If you've never experienced a worship night, uh, it's a really incredible moment for us just to come together and to have an encounter with God. Uh, those things uh, cannot be fabricated, but we do want to anticipate uh, just meeting up with God in that extended time of worship. So you don't want to miss it. Be here uh, this Thursday night. Uh, can't wait to experience that with all of you. Uh, several years ago, I heard about this uh, young couple that had been dating. Things were getting pretty serious. They were moving towards marriage. And as soon as the young lady's parents found out about that, they said, hey, we got to have this uh, guy over to our house for a meal uh, we don't know much about him. We want to get to know him better. So they have him over. And afterwards, the father asks the, uh, this young man to go out into the backyard to have a conversation. And so he just begins to kind of, you know, ask him some questions. He said, hey, you know, uh, things seem to be getting kind of serious between you and my daughter. Like, what are your plans? What are your intentions? And he was just like, well, sir, you know, eventually, you know, one day I would like to ask for your, you know, hand. And I kind of see this moving towards marriage. And the, the dad's like, well, okay. And he's like, well, you know, uh, 
what are your plans for work? And he's like, well, you know, I don't have many, um, but it's okay because I'm just trusting that God's going to provide. And he's like, well, that's admirable of you. And he goes, but, you know, uh, you know she's used to a, a pretty decent lifestyle. How, how are you going to, you know, maintain that level of lifestyle for her? And he's like, sir, don't, don't worry about it. I just trust that God's going to provide. And this was kind of the way the narrative was going. He's like, well, you know, uh, how are you going to afford, afford an engagement ring? And what if you have kids one day in the future? How are you going to take care of my grandkids? And this was the same answer over and over again. It's like, sir, don't worry about it. I'm just confident God will provide. So at the end of the evening, they're, they're leaving. And uh, the man's wife comes to him and she says, well, how did the conversation go? What did you learn about him? And he goes, well, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. And he goes, what do you want first? She goes, well, give me the bad news. And he goes, well, it looks like our daughter is going to marry somebody with no money, no plans and no job. She's like, oh, dear, what's the good news? And he goes, well, the good news is that young man thinks I'm God. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, you, any of you know him? That's good. Well, uh, today we're uh, wrapping up this three-week series of messages that we've been in called Adventures in Dating and Marriage. And if you've missed any of it or you're just now joining us, really the kind of the big premise is, is that relationships, especially dating relationships and marriage, like it can be so exciting and fulfilling at the same time, it can be so challenging and crazy complicated. And uh, just like an adventure, you know, adventures are filled with ups and downs and unexpected twists and turns and things you didn't see coming. And the things, same thing is true in our relationships, especially dating relationships and marriage. And uh, the principles that we're learning apply to all relationships. So you, see, you may be here today and you're like, well, I'm not dating anybody. I'm not married. I can't even, you know, foresee that uh, in my life for a long, long time. And yet these principles will still apply to a lot of our other relationships. It's just that the marriage relationship intensifies everything like times 100. And the theme verse for us in this series has been Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And I encourage you to commit this verse to memory on week one. And I hope that you've been able to. And if you've slipped your mind, it's really not hard to memorize. So just look at it one more time. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, that verse is simple, but it is packed with some tremendous wisdom and truth. See, the X factor in all all of our relationships, not, not just dating and marriage, is the mindset that we bring to it. So like the quality of your relationships with your family or the quality of your friendships, and this would certainly be true, would be true in dating and marriage, uh, is a really a direct re result of the reflection of your mindset. So if you're in a relationship and you're not fully happy or satisfied with it, and you're like, this needs to change, the first step to bring about change is a different mindset. And then the mindset that you're like, okay, what kind of mindset should we have? Well, have the same mindset of Jesus. Now you might say, okay, well, what was the mindset of Jesus? Well, the very next verse in verse six, we haven't read this yet. It says, it describes his mindset. Who being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, Jesus wasn't just, uh, you know, he wasn't entitled. He wasn't trying to uh, play any, you know, sort of like, power games here. He was just like, you know, he was fully God, but he didn't use that to his advantage. Here's what he did. Rather, verse seven, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus' mindset was humility. Jesus' mindset was, was, I've come not to be served, but to serve and to lay my life down as a ransom for many. Now, the secret sauce to like any thriving relationship is humility. It's an act of service. Now, please hear me. I'm not talking about allowing this other person to take advantage of you and certainly not to mistreat you or abuse you. If you're being mistreated or you're being abused, then you need to get out. What I am saying is that you humble yourself and humbling yourself, you can still say no and you can still establish boundaries. By humility, it's the overall disposition that you bring into a relationship, especially your spouse, that, that says things like sort of like this, like here's your mindset towards your spouse. You know what, that's not the way that I would do it, but I'm open to the way that you would do it. 
uh, I, I, um, I'm going to recognize here that in this argument, um, y- you might be right. That, that I may need to see things from your perspective. And I'm certainly willing to put your needs above my own. There's this great little passage in the book of Ephesians that addresses husbands and wives. And it, there's this great little verse that we oftentimes skip past too quickly that says, um, submit to one another, mutual submission, out of your reverence for Christ. So because of my relationship with Jesus, I can humble myself and submit myself to my spouse. And when we are able to do this, like when two imperfect, broken human beings can do this in a relationship, what that does is it breeds this powerful little word called trust. And trust is the most important ingredient in any relationship, but especially the marriage relationship. You can think of it this way. Trust is the fuel for your marriage. And without it, it's kind of like a car without gasoline. You know, it's there, but it's not really going anywhere. And so you got to have trust to fuel the relationship. So by way of quick review, on week number one, if you were here, do you remember the relationship attachment model that I showed you? And you've got these like, you kind of think of them like faders on a soundboard. So when you meet somebody, you get to know them and then you develop some trust. And then out of that trust, you determine if you can rely on them. And then um, you make a commitment and then touch. And oftentimes within our society, maybe we meet somebody, we really don't know them like super well, but we're attracted to them. And we just immediately run to touch and we take that dial all the way up and it gets things out of balance in the relationship real early. And then you've got stuff that you got to deal with as you kind of get to know one another. Now, if you're single, that relationship attachment model, the key word here is progression. Like take your time, slow things down. It's kind of like rock climbing. Make sure that you've got a solid foothold before you reach for the next handhold. Uh, but oftentimes we, we have a tendency to run through the dials. If you're married, the key word uh, to this model is balance. And so you're constantly sort of monitoring these faders and trying to figure out, okay, what, what, what dials need to be adjusted? This becomes like the subject of date night. This becomes the subject of conversations. You become a student of your spouse and you're beginning just to kind of monitor the dials. Now, um, and oftentimes what one of you, it, it really values like of those dials or maybe you're really good at, the other one uh, um, maybe values something else or is really good at something else. So I don't know, uh, let's just say that uh, one of you in the marriage relationship really values the touch dial. You know, I can't imagine that really happening, but let's just say that one of you in the relationship values the touch dial. And you're like, you know what? I think that the touch dial needs to go up like a little bit, but the other one doesn't necessarily see it. Now, here's the thing. Um, uh, The answer isn't to just take the touch dial and kind of take it all the way up. The answer is to actually pay attention to one of the other dials. Uh, maybe uh, no. Can I get a good amen? All right. And no. And then you, you increase the no dial and then the touch dial goes up as a result. I love what uh, uh, retired pastor Rick Warren has to say about this. He says, sex with one wife for life is not like playing one record over and over again, but learning one instrument really well for years that you were able to play beautiful music. So we see here that when it comes to the dials, every, I just want to say this to hopefully encourage you, every relationship, even the healthiest of relationships. Let's just say that the two of you are the most compatible people on the planet. You know, you finish each other's sentences, you ride tandem bikes, like you're, you're just like two peas in a pod. You make the rest of us want to vomit. <laughs> Your relationship is still going to get out of balance. It's called life. It's called kids. <laughs> it's, it's called, you know, work. Like, it, it's just going to get out of balance. And, and when you do, when these faders get out of balance, they don't automatically self-correct. It, create, it takes great intentionality. So that's by way of review. Well, here's where I want to go for the rest of this message to land the plane on this series, is I want to talk about trust. In particular, how does trust get developed in a romantic relationship? How do you maintain healthy trust? And then ultimately, this is where I want to end. What do you do when trust is broken? So if you're taking notes, uh, or maybe you just might want to take a picture of the screen behind me with your phone. Uh, Here's kind of a a few defining principles. The the bonding agent in any relationship is trust. 
And you, that cannot be microwaved. That has, you have to take your time with that. And it has to be fostered and maintained in the relationship. And to know somebody and to trust somebody, those are two very different things. You know, chances are right now, you know a whole lot more people in your life than you trust. Because here's the definition of trust. There may be multiple, but here's the one that I'll give you. Trust is a feeling of security or confidence in another person. And it takes a long time to achieve and it could be lost, unfortunately, in a moment. And your feelings of trust don't come just from what you know about the other person. But follow me in the logic of this. Rather, they come from what you decide to think about what you know. This is called your trust narrative. And you have a trust narrative right now around everybody that you know. Right now in your mind, you have a trust narrative with your boss. It's either good or it's not. You know, you have a trust narrative with your roommate. You have a trust narrative with extended family. And you have a trust narrative going on right now with the person that you're dating or the person that you're married to. And that trust narrative may or may not be accurate. And there are a few data points that's actually informing the narrative. So let me just kind of give you an example uh, of what I mean. Let's just say that uh, you're single, you're not dating anybody, but you're looking and you go to a wedding, mutual friend, and you see an attractive guy at this wedding and he's alone, he's by himself. And afterwards at the, you know, the kind of the reception, he comes over, strikes up a conversation with you and immediately you like him. He's a good looking guy. And uh, you know, you sit down and you start talking. And um, here's one of the things you notice about him. He makes you laugh. And your dad had a great sense of humor and he made you laugh. And this just kind of sets you at ease. And so you're just at ease in this conversation. And then you find out that what he does for work is he works with several nonprofits that have a good cause. And man, that just causes you to, your respect level for him goes up. And throughout the whole conversation, he's just a great listener and he's asking all sorts, all sorts of questions about you. And you're just like, man, he just seems really, really interested in who I am. And he just seems so selfless. And, and then to top it all off, he shows you a picture of his brand new puppy. And your heart just melts. You're like, this is the perfect guy for me. This, this is amazing. So you exchange numbers and you decide to go on your first date. And then over the course of the next several months, you begin to date. And you're, you developed a trust narrative right out of the gates that, you know what? You trust this guy. At least you trust him enough to kind of get to know him and to begin to date him. But over the course of the next several months, you begin to notice some things. You begin to notice that everybody that he meets, he either flirts with or flatters and it's inauthentic. And it's starting to cause you a little bit of concern because he, he talks kind of negatively behind their back and they never see that. Uh, you, you find out that um, he uh, just got fired from his job and actually he tells you that he's been let go of his last three jobs in the past two years. And you're thinking, okay, there's, there's something, there's a trend here that's not, not good. Um, you notice that uh, his anger flares up like in a moment. Whether it's in the car, you know, somebody cuts him off in traffic and he just explodes. Um, maybe his anger has been directed at you a couple of times and then immediately he apologizes all over himself, but nothing seems to change. Maybe well, initially in your first cut dialogue and conversation with him where it just seemed like he was listening to you and asking great questions. Now all of a sudden his great questions feel a little bit more like interrogation and manipulation. And then to top it all off, he'd been keeping this from you for months, but you found out he also had a cat. And you're just like, oh no, I thought I knew this guy. So what happens is, is that your trust narrative is not necessarily who he actually is. This is why it is so important to slow down in a relationship, pay attention to the dials, really get to know and trust and rely upon somebody, make a commitment before you ever bond with them through touch. And study after study reveals that we often hone in on a couple of data points and we put those to the forefront of our mind and then we kind of diminish or dismiss everything else and it kind of goes in the background. Here, here's kind of an example of this. You've probably seen uh, this picture or maybe a picture like it, um, but uh, take a look at that picture. Now, how many of you, I'm just kind of curious, how many of you see kind of a, an older, you know, somewhat unattractive lady in the picture? Just go ahead and raise up your hand if that's what you see. All right. Now, how many of you see a younger, attractive lady in the, in the picture? Oh, I see what kind of a church we have. This is interesting. Now, actually, um, so some of you are going, what are you talking about? Well, you know, kind of that, you know, 
big bulbous nose there. You know, if you kind of see that, you kind of see there's like an older kind of attractive lady, you kind of see the beady eyes, she's kind of looking this way. Or if you see the younger lady, you kind of see you're looking at her from kind of a side angle and that's like her jawline right there. Now, now here's the thing that I just want to point out to you. And maybe you've seen other images like this. There's lots of conversation going on in the room right now. It's, <laughs> it's just an illustration. All right, so... So what happens is, is you look at an image like this and then immediately you focus in on a couple of data points right away and then you sort of diminish or put the other data points in the background of your mind. What we do with images like this, we do with people. Which is why some people make a really good first impression and then you find out later they are not who they presented themselves to be. Or some people make a really poor first impression <laughs> And then you find out later there's more substance there than what you thought. See, we've got to be so careful in how we develop a trust narrative. This happens in relationships all the time. You know, in Judges chapter 16, there's this uh, relationship between the, this uh, really dysfunctional couple named Samson and Delilah. Some of you may know the story. Others of you, if you've never read it, go read it sometime. It's, it's wild. And Samson has this incredible strength given to him by God. And the way in which that strength would be taken from him is if he cuts his hair and so Samson has his enemies. And so they kind of uh, get in with Samson's wife, Delilah, and they kind of send her in as kind of like an undercover agent to kind of take him down. And notice the question that she asks him in verse six. Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. I don't know, is that just me or does that seem like a big red flag? Like if I'm dating somebody, hey, you know, I don't know, just by chance. What's your greatest weakness? You know, it's just like, like what, what's, going, what's happening here? Now, now here's the deal. Uh, their relationship was not built on trust because if you read the narrative, you know that Samson lies to her. And so she takes that lie, tells the others, hey, well, this is how his strength is gone. And then they come and they try to subdue him and it doesn't work. And that happens over and over and over again where he's lying to her and then she's continuing to try to deceive him. It happens. She asks him the same question in verse six, four different times and he never catches on. This is why I said on week number one, for the first 18 months or so of like a romantic relationship, your prefrontal cortex like literally shuts down. And that's fine. You know, it's like puppy love, infatuation. It is a wonderful, wonderful phase in the relationship. This is why you have to take your time. This is why, by the way, if you're a teenager and you're thinking this series is not for me, this is the time for you to think through these things before you ever develop an infatuation or an emotional attachment with somebody, you're thinking about character issues long before you meet the other person and all of a sudden you focus in on a few of their characteristics and you become blind to the others. This is why you gotta involve other people that are wise and discerning and love you and, and listen to what they say because they're not trying to be a downer on your relationship, they're, tr they're trying to be objective. See, listen, don't just trust somebody by what they say. Trust somebody by their actions revealed over time. And I'm not talking about like being paranoid or hiring a private investigator or anything like that. I'm just talking about being wise and discerning. Don't rush into the relationship. And I know some of you right now are pushing back on me. I can hear it. Like you're saying, but Pastor Aaron, he loves me so much. You don't understand. He broke his parole to come see me. <laughs> and I would say, case in point. So let me kind of shift now to uh, the importance of trust in a married relationship. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said this one time. Now, let me just go ahead and qualify this by saying, I don't know how much marriage advice we can take from Ben, <laughs> given what we know about him. How, however, I'll take this one and I'll, I'll explain what he means by this. But I think there is some real uh, wisdom in what he says here. He says this, before marriage, keep your eyes wide open. Um, but afterwards... Half shut. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, let me kind of uh, unpack this. Uh, what he's essentially saying is, is don't just uh, constantly be holding every offense from your spouse. Um, uh, oh, don't be holding on to that for a long, long time. Believe the best about your spouse. Now, now let me kind of take this a little bit uh, layer further. If you're married right now, and if you're here with your spouse, please don't answer this out loud. Aren't there like um, several dozen 
things about your spouse that just kind of drive you crazy? It, there was a lady in the 930 service that said, amen. You know, I was like, okay, that's, that's gonna be a fun car ride home. But actually uh, what happens is, is that before marriage, this is how it can, has a tendency to go. The things that maybe attracted you to the other person after marriage end up kind of driving you nuts. It's like the old phrase from that country preacher, before marriage opposites attract, after, after marriage opposites attack. And that's what can happen. So, you know, before marriage, what you loved about her so much is that she was so outgoing and bubbly, a little social butterfly. After marriage, you're like, ah, she won't shut up. You know, it's like before marriage, he was so ambitious. After marriage, he won't stop working. Right? And so these little things that can kind of get on our nerves a little bit and they just become these bigger and bigger things. And it ends up, if we don't deal with it in healthy ways, it damages trust. Now, let me um, offer this disclaimer about what I'm getting ready to say because uh, I am not talking about the big breaches in trust. I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute. Uh, I'm talking about the, the smaller um, breaking of trust that fit into the category. Uh, it's a healthy relationship. It's a healthy marriage. You both are selfless. You're working on it, but you're just a broken, fallen human being. And so you're going to hurt one another. And so let me just kind of offer that um, disclaimer. When your spouse says something that hurts you, or when your spouse maybe uh, fails to live up to an expectation that you have for them in your mind, how do you keep the hope of intimacy alive? See, when your spouse says or behaves in a way that, that puts you off, the narrative that you choose to believe about why will determine if trust stays high or low in the relationship. And in a healthy yet imperfect relationship, do, here's, what, here's the secret of long marriage, healthy marriages is that these are two people that choose to believe the best about the intentions of the other person. Dr. Van Epp, uh, who I quoted on week one, says this. He goes, you live with two spouses, the spouse in your home and the spouse in your head. And it affects your trust level and your emotional bond with them. In uh, 1 Corinthians 13, we read this passage at a lot of weddings and it's this description, it's a paragraph of what love is. And it's a great description. It's like love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. But in verse seven, it says this, love always trusts. And that word trust can be translated believes. So you could read this about your spouse from that verse, that trust always believes the best about the other person. So when my spouse puts me off, hurts me, annoys me, and they will, I can choose to believe the best about why, or I can choose to believe the worst, and then I can go and have a conversation and confirm it, and we can kind of work through it together. Marriage is two people fighting, not each other, but fighting for one another because we have an enemy. And I would say that all marriage can be difficult and hard, Christian marriages have an extra strike against them because you have an external enemy trying to take you down. And I've mentioned this before. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Kind of changes things a little bit when you read that verse within the context of your marriage. And this image right here, I think, kind of captures it. Is that... Uh, you know, your marriage is the innocent little gazelle that Satan is on the prowl over. And he, he, here's what this sounds like, by the way. You ever heard this voice whispering in your ear? Assume the worst. He'll never change. He will never emotionally connect with you. She will never understand. In fact, if she knew everything about you, she, she'd kick you out today. She isn't interested in what you're interested in. How about this one? You married the wrong person. Your soulmate is out there somewhere else and you deserve to be happy and go find them. Or, or what about this? You, you know, you, you just got married so young. Two people have changed and, and you, you, you know, it's okay to kind of call it quits and, and move along. Life is too short to be unhappy. Follow your heart. And he is constantly trying to wedge his way in there little by little. And so we think that the answer is to jump to greener pastures only to find that that wasn't the solution. 
Statistically, uh, second marriages, there's a greater chance of divorce with second marriages than first marriages. Now, I'm not saying that second marriages can't make it. I know a bunch of people that are on their second marriage and it's healthy and it's thriving. But I am saying statistically, there's a greater increase of the possibility of divorce. And you just got to ask yourself, why? And could it be is because you really didn't deal with the root of the problem in your first marriage. You ran from that problem straight into another problem. And you followed yourself right into the second marriage. And you said, you know what, the grass looks greener on the other side, so you sold the house, when in reality, maybe what you needed to do was fertilize your lawn. And when you get to this place of contempt, the relationship is on extremely shaky ground. And walls or fences that get built up between a husband and a wife don't happen overnight. They happen through a course of years and years and years where we chose to believe the worst version of why our spouse said or did something to us. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Uh, I've asked a, a young couple in our church to come out on stage to help me illustrate this next point. So could you please welcome uh, Quad and Taylor onto the stage as they make their way out. Welcome Quad and Taylor. Now, uh, um, Taylor is uh, one of our leadership residents uh, in our student ministry. She's doing a, a phenomenal job. And Quad serves in our worship department. And you'll see him oftentimes up here playing the guitar or drums. He's a man of many, many talents. And, uh, and so uh, recently, um, Quad and Taylor got engaged. So that's exciting. That's exciting. <laughs> Happened uh, about, about a month ago. About a month ago. And uh, so, uh, you know, you all are invited to the wedding. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. And what I thought I would do is uh, I, I just thought that I would do a little premarital counseling with Quad and Taylor just in front of our whole church family. All right. So what can go wrong? All right. I don't think anything can go wrong. But um, uh, what, um, you guys, how long have you been dating? Come on, man, you gotta be Six quicker months. than that. You've been dating. Six months in two days. Six months in two days. Now you guys are moving fast. Mm -hmm. right, get to know each other. All right, so, <laughs> so uh, you guys already uh, had an argument? Oh, yeah. You guys argue? Yes, yeah. Not often. Not all, yeah, you don't wanna to confess too much up here. I mean, that's a little pride. <laughs> we understand. All right, so, so here's the thing like, when you guys get into an argument, and um, what was the subject of the last argument? No details, just generalities. Scheduling conflict. Scheduling conflict. <laughs> we know what that means. All right, so, so scheduling conflict, I don't know what happened. You know, maybe, you know, uh, one of you showed up late or, you know, didn't see it on the calendar, whatever. All right, so here's what happens is that, Quad, um, you guys get into an argument, and the way that you choose to handle that is almost like this, this plank of wood here, and you've offended Taylor. Now, now Taylor, what you choose to do with the offense determines the direction and the trajectory of your future marriage. So with this offense, now, now Quad is going to say and do stupid things because he's a man. <laughs> it's what we're really, am I right? Oh, yeah. Like we're really good at it. So, <laughs> so that's just gonna happen. And so when he says and does something really, really dumb, in that moment, you can believe the worst version about why he said it or the believe the best and then, and then confront it and try to deal with it. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to clear the plank because if we don't, what ends up happening is we take the plank, whether we realize it or not, and it becomes a post beginning to create a wedge in our relationship. So uh, Taylor, I cannot imagine, knowing what I know about you, I cannot imagine you ever hurting Quad. You're such a sweetheart, right? So but we know that that's not reality. There's going to be something that you say or do that's going to hurt Quad's feelings. I don't know. Maybe he's been working on his six-pack abs and you haven't noticed, you know. And so, so anyway, what happens is, is that, you know, Taylor's going to do or say something. And Quad, same kind of thing. She's going to hand you an offense. And what you choose to do with this in the moment, like how you choose, like the trust narrative that develops in your mind over her motives is going to determine a lot. So you can sit down and lovingly ask her about it, try to clear it, offer forgiveness and grace, or we take the plank and maybe we just like say, you know what, like, and she hurt me. And it becomes another post in the relationship. Um, Quad, has there ever been a time whenever uh, you guys are getting ready to go on a date and have you ever um, asked Taylor where she wants to go to dinner? Mm -hmm. 
Has she ever said that she doesn't know or care and you decide? Yes. That's a lie. <laughs> so I'm just gonna like save you a ton of grief, bro. Like never ask that question. So Taylor, can you close your ears for a minute? We just need to have, so what you do is you say, hey babe, we're gonna go to dinner night. We're gonna go to your favorite place. Guess where it is? And wherever she says, take her there. All right, so. So what's gonna happen though is that, you know, Quad's gonna like take Taylor to the wrong place or you're gonna forget an anniversary. Did he remember Valentine's? Yeah, of course. Okay, good. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> You've only been dating six months. All right, so, so what's gonna happen though, eventually there's gonna come a year or whatever, like he forgets something, he's gonna hand you this offense. Whatever you choose to do with this is gonna determine the health of the relationship. But if it just goes in here, it becomes another post. And... Um, Here's, here's what can end up happening is that once you guys have been married for five, seven, 10 years or more, all of a sudden now you begin to recycle arguments and you've begun to have this conversation or this argument and it's become an impasse. And so here's the deal. Taylor says something or does something that hurts you. Or Quad, you do something that hurts Taylor. And here's the narrative we say in our mind. I've already talked to them about this and he always does this. She always reacts this way. So you know what? I'm not even going to bother. And we become passive aggressive and we don't even give the opportunity to really give the poke. We just immediately take it and we go to here. And if we don't clear the offenses, see, here's the thing is that being offended is a moment. Living offended is a choice. And so if we just say, you know what, I'm just gonna stay offended. I'm just gonna believe the worst version. And I can't believe it. You know what, my soulmate's probably out there somewhere. And over years and years of time of not dealing with these things, they become posts in the relationship. They become a dividing wall of hostility. And then what God brought together ends up being two people sitting across an attorney's office dividing assets. Hey, would you give Quad and Taylor a hand? Thank you guys. Appreciate it. You guys, I, I just want to end our time with this. See, this right here, this reflection right here are, is just like the everyday, like common things that we may do to hurt each other. But some of you are sitting there going, yeah, but Aaron, what, what about the big things? What about the big breaches in trust? And like the big things, like maybe, maybe a, a hidden addiction that you didn't know about and then it's compounded over time. Or maybe, um, maybe it's an abusive situation or maybe you learned of the affair. And you're like, how in the world can we reconcile? How, how in the world, what is the way forward? Now, I just want to say this, is that oftentimes within society, people will kind of say, well, the automatic to any one of those big breaches in trust is to divorce. And I'm not saying that that isn't an option. And I'm not saying that you don't have the, the, um, you know, the, the reasons to, to do that. I am saying it doesn't have to be. And that actually God can redeem and restore the most broken things. It's what he does. And I've actually known of, I was talking to a man this morning who uh, he and his wife, they had a big breach in trust 12 years ago. And he said, I just want to testify that if the two of us will stay and fight and humble ourselves, that God can redeem and restore anything. So can I just leave you with these two things real quickly for those of you, like how do you rebuild trust in the midst of a big breach? For this spouse whose trust has been broken, realize that trust and forgiveness are not the same. I think oftentimes uh, with a deep break in trust, spouses will um, withhold forgiveness, thinking that what that means is that they immediately need to trust again. And that's not necessarily true. So you're withholding forgiveness because you think that means I got to trust and I can't trust. And then it just leads to a bitter heart. You can forgive Trust takes a long time and actually you, you might not ever get there. Scripture commands us to forgive. Never once does scripture command us to trust an untrustworthy person. For the spouse who's, who broke the trust and maybe you really love your spouse and you messed up and you know it and you want the marriage to work uh, I just want to offer you uh, the, these words of, of caution here. It is likely that you will want things to get back to normal before your spouse is ready. And that's understandable. It's just not realistic. And so you are on your spouse's timeline, not yours. Second thing, you will often want trust to be given without significant changes to the relationship. 
And so I, I've talked to some married couples before, Big Breach and Trust, and they decide to stay together, go to counseling and work on it. And maybe six months later, eight months later, whatever it is, one of them who broke the trust is complaining and saying, you know what, it's just so confining. She just constantly wants to see what's on my phone and she's constantly following me around and find my friends. And, and uh, it, just, it just doesn't seem like she trusts me. It's just so confining. And I'd be like, well, yeah. In order for there to be healing, there has to be a confining. It's kind of like when you break an arm, you set it in a cast and it restricts the movement. Why? So that healing can occur. And that just can't be fast forwarded. You've got to allow that to play out. But, but here's the thing. Um, when, in, going back to the relationship attachment model, when trust is broken, no goes way down. And so that's going to require more time and more transparency. And without it, a new trust narrative cannot emerge. But if you would forgive, and if the person who broke the trust is willing to humble themselves and to make some real uh, efforts at change, listen, God can renew and revive and restore anything. It's called beauty from the ashes. And you know what gets under Satan's skin any more than that? Nothing. The fact that he's like, man, I, did, I threw everything that I could to break you guys up, but, but it's not working. But it requires two people, not just one. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I think it's unfortunate that that verse has been so overused that we resort it to an axiom on a coffee mug. But it's not. In all things means in all things. And God can take that and he can work for the good. And there is hope. There can be hope on the other side of a big breach in trust by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you might be like, well, Aaron, where in the world can I find that kind of strength to offer that kind of forgiveness? In the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories is a story of a prophet named Hosea. And God tells Hosea to go and marry an adulterous woman, a woman who has a checkered past. Her name is Gomer, which is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> but he marries this woman who's got a checkered past and they have a family together. And then one day, and really what God does is he does this as a living illustration to say, um, as a people, you have been unfaithful to me. You have committed adultery on me. And yet I have come to be in relationship with you. And one day Hosea comes home to an empty house and he gets a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach because he doesn't want to believe what might be true, that Gomer's being unfaithful to him once again. And he goes back to the red light district of town and sure enough, he sees her at a distance in the arms of another man. And he is upset and he is hurt and he is broken and he has every right to be. And here's what God says to him. Go, run after her, take her, forgive her, restore the relationship, bring her home as your wife once again. And Hosea didn't want to do it, but that's what he did. And this is what God is saying to us. God is not saying, be a doormat. God is not saying, allow your spouse to take advantage of you or allow them to get away with it. What he is saying is that this is an illustration of a faithful God who runs after unfaithful people and extends grace to us when we never deserved it. I don't know if your marriage will survive one of those big breaches in trust. It really largely depends upon the, the demeanor, the disposition of the person who broke the trust. But I do know that there is a God who is powerful enough to bring healing to the, the worst wounds and breaches in trust that you might experience. And it's a supernatural thing. It's a miraculous thing. I'll, I'll tell you this, talking to couples, there, there was a man that I spoke to this morning, I referred to him earlier, he's been married 37 years. And he said at year 25 is when we had a big breach in trust. And yet we were willing to work on it. We were willing to work on our friendship. And now 37 years into the marriage, I can honestly say we're the best of friends. God can take whatever ashes you might be holding right now and he can breathe beautiful, beautiful life into it if you'd be willing to submit that to him. And I know right now that this might be heavy. There might be some of you that are walking through some things right now. Maybe you just learned of something this week. Maybe some of you, this brushes up against an old wound. 
I just want to just create a space. I know traditionally right now, this is the time in the service where a lot of us have a tendency just to want to start peeling out. And I get that. I understand that. Parking is fun. But I just want to encourage you just to kind of sit in this moment, not bypass what it is that the work of the Holy Spirit might want to do in you. Maybe right now your, your, health, your, your relationship is healthy. Your marriage is great. Man, thank God for that. Others of you, maybe you're hurting. Maybe you just might want to reach over, grab the hand of your spouse and pray together right now in this moment. Maybe right now you just need to, God, I just need your strength because I don't know how to move forward. God, I'm the one who broke the trust and I am just drowning in shame. God, would you please forgive me? Just sit in this moment for a moment, praying to the God who runs after those of us who have been unfaithful to him and allow him to speak new words of life into really broken places. Father, we come to you right now. We're so grateful that even in the midst of our sin, as the book of Romans tells us, Christ died for us. So Father, I just pray right now that you would bring healing power into our relationships, into our marriages, where maybe trust has been broken. God, would you please give us the strength to believe the best about our spouse? not because necessarily they deserve it, but because instead of fighting them, we wanna fight for them. So I ask right now that your Holy Spirit would just put a a hedge of protection around the marriages in this room and those who are listening. I pray that you would give us the strength to realize that there is a spiritual battle going on that wants to break up marriages and families because that will weaken the church and society. God, would you please give us the strength and the ability, but far beyond our own ability to do so, to offer grace and forgiveness because you've offered those same things to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're just gonna sit for a moment. I'm just gonna ask you to just pray, reflect, and then the team's gonna come out, lead us in a song. If you need somebody to pray with, we'll have prayer counselors around the room. So church, as we stay in this posture of reflection and this posture of prayer, we're going to continue on into worship. And um, one thing I would say is I'd I'd prompt you one more time. If there's anything that that the pastor said and then in his message has been tugging at your heart, I would would implore you, hey, don't leave today without coming down and and praying with some of our prayer team. We have them all scattered across the front of the stage right here and across the sides of the stage. And we would love to just pray with you, walk with you, partner with you today. And if you're able, I just ask you to stand across the room. And we're gonna go back into the chorus of that song here in just a few moments. And if that's you, just as we sing, I invite you, why don't you just go ahead and just make your way on out of your seat, come on down to the front. We're gonna pray with you. We're gonna meet with you and believe God with you together as we stand and we sing.
faithfulness. Man, he is so good. Church, as you leave service today, man, I hope that you feel challenged, but I hope that you feel encouraged and strengthened in your faith. And just one more time, I want to implore you, hey, if, if that's you, you'd say, man, I just, I feel like I want to pray with somebody. There's some things that I want to talk through, pray through. Maybe you're with your, with your spouse, your significant other, say, hey, w- let's, let's go down front, let's pray together. There's still time, so I would invite you. Our prayer team is going to be lined across the front of the stage right here as we, as we close service today. But as we do that, church knows that we love you, that we pray for you. God bless you guys. We'll see you here Thursday night for worship night and Sunday morning. We'll see you guys.